A married couple try to save their marriage with music in Band-Aid. Naomi Watts struggles to become the mother of a genius in The Book of Henry. And Owen Wilson is back once again on the track as Lightning McQueen in Pixar's Cars 3. That's all on this edition of Movies with Mark. Hi, I'm Mark McPherson, movie critic for Moviespoon.com, and today we're going to be taking a look at three movies that are currently playing in theaters right now. Our first film is Pixar's Cars 3, and I find myself asking questions that I really shouldn't be about the, this Cars world, like how are buildings made if all the cars just have tires, like who installs those little buttons on the ground so that they can turn on televisions and computers and all that stuff, and uh, you, you know, how, how does all this, how does this world assembled and what's its role in nature? And I really shouldn't be asking these questions, and I didn't with the first Cars movie, and the, I didn't really with the second Cars movie. Uh, because I think there was enough going on with the story where I wasn't questioning the world too much. But now, I'm forced to with Cars 3 because it more or less deals with death to the point where I start asking myself, well, how do cars die and how are cars born? And how is this, like, shifting of the guard working here? It's like, I don't think Pixar really thought this through. Owen Wilson voices Lightning McQueen once more, the hotshot racing champion who's not quite a champion anymore as there are a bunch of new cars that have come into the racing circuit and they're much more stylish and sleek and they have, uh, they have the latest materials and they have like neon lights and they're so fast they can zoom right past them and, he, and McQueen has to come to the realization that, well, I'm getting older and you know, I, I can't keep doing this. Eventually I might have to retire, but I don't want to retire yet. I just want to have one more race in me. So how can he compete with these new hotshot young racers? Well, uh, for me, like the, what I first thought was that, okay, well, he's just going to get, you know, uh, you know, that, that new material that all the young people are using, like, oh, I'll just switch out my parts. But apparently, you can't do this. M maybe, maybe I'm forgetting this, but it seems like they just kind of glaze over the fact that uh, that cars just can't get new parts. Maybe they're just stuck with them for life. And if you, and if you try to switch them out, you die or something. Or maybe it's maybe it's some sort of like you know shame thing where you can't get new parts because then you know it's kind of like uh, like like getting fake boobs or something. I I don't know. That they don't really explore this. All that you need to know is that in order for him to get better, he apparently has to train. It's kind of like you know like a sports movie. You know when you think you're you're too old, you can't you can't be in the fight. You can't get him one more good round. But if you train enough, maybe you can get there. And to get to this point, uh, Lightning McQueen takes on a new sponsorship that that basically set him up with this state-of-the-art facility where he can train on uh, treadmills, uh, where he can go on a virtual reality simulation, and where he can do meditation. Now, the whole idea of this training facility, you know, like you, in order to be a better racer, you got to train, you got to, you know, work your mind, you got to exercise cars, which is ridiculous. I mean, it's a, it's a very ridiculous thing. But the problem is, I don't think it's, it's silly enough for this type of story because this story is treated very somberly. It, like it focuses very hard on how, you know, how much it sucks to realize that you're getting older and that you're retiring and that, you know, that, you know, you think your best days are behind you and the, the passing of the baton. There's this new hotshot racer voiced by Army Hammer who kind of like looks down on McQueen and sort of like pities him and he's, and he's always just ahead of McQueen. He realized like, man, I can't quite get there. What am I going to do? And he has to try to figure himself out through there. There's this subplot with Lightning McQueen's trainer uh, called Cruz who she used to, she had dreams of wanting to be a racer and she only ended up as a trainer but she really wanted to be a racer and she really wants to go into a race when everyone said she can't go into a race because she's a girl. It's like yeah it's this whole female empowerment angle and that would be cool but it's kind of forced more in towards the last act of the film and it just, it, it comes across as just about everything else in this film which is that you know, it, it's trying to like force it as as bluntly as it can. Like this whole this whole idea that you know old people are being shoved out by young people in technology. It's about as blunt as that. It's saying like, hey, look, women can be race car drivers too. Women can be in the races too. Yeah, that's 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 great. But uh, just you know, I wish this could be a little bit better. Just because like I mean, these messages are great. You know, it is great that you know you can have you know old people still not feel like they're out of the race and have women feel like they can be in these races. That's cool stuff. Uh, it's just, I don't know, it's just the, the, the sentimentality of it and just the, the writing, it's, it's not there. The problem with this movie, though, I think, is that it relies way too much on nostalgia and sentimentality 
and and draw back to the previous film as if you know it kind of feels like it's trying to be Toy Story 3 where it assumes that you have so much invested in these characters and that you love them so much that it's 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 hard to see them go off and and retire and not race anymore but the problem is I never, at least for me at least, I never had that that sense of, you know, lovable, that I love these characters. Uh, they just sort of felt like, you know, characters who were there. They kind of fulfilled their roles, and that was about it. But uh, but they tried to bring out this sort of, um, the sentimental standpoint where it realizes, you know, you might not be able to see these characters again. Um, some of which we know we won't see again, more or less. Like, they bring back in the character of Doc Hudson, who once trained McQueen. And, you know, since Paul Newman passed away, you know, we can't really be in there. But there were some recordings left over from the first Cars movie uh, of Paul Newman that they put into this movie to sort of, you know, you know call back to, uh, the, you know, the glory days when Doc Hudson was training McQueen. And it's just like a bitter reminder that, you know, that... that that Paul Newman is gone, and there are other characters here. Like there's um, there's Rusty and Dusty, who are uh, who are two characters who are voiced by the two guys who are on NPR's Car Talk. Um, one of them has died since then, and uh, and 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 they're so present on screen. Just reminds like, oh, you know, th this person's no longer here. And then you have like the Volkswagen that was once voiced by George Carlin. It's like, oh, he's no longer here. And it's like, oh my goodness. And, and it, it and it, I I understand. Like it's a little bit more. You know, it's not as intentional, it's just kind of like a, an unintentional effect of realizing that, wow, people are getting older and people are, are dying and, you know, they're, they're not quite here anymore. Uh, yeah, which is a great, a great tone you want for a Pixar movie, especially one about talking cars that go around a racetrack over and over and over again and try to weave some sort of sports drama out of it. The film isn't a total loss. I mean, the, the animation looks all right, and a lot of the environments look pretty cool from like, you know, you get to see beaches, and you get to see these nice big raceways, and you get to see these this very dirty demolition derby, which, I have to bring this up though, uh, the demolition derby. There's a point early on in the film where, where McQueen spins out on the track and he flies through the air and he crashes and burns, and well, I don't know if he burns quite because we don't really see any fire, but he crashes a lot and it looks very... Uh, very shocking, like, like, oh my goodness, there's, there's real damage to M McQueen, he's, he's hurt, he's hurt. But later on, there's a scene where he goes to a demolition derby to sort of, like, like train undercover and sort of become a, a better race car driver through a demolition derby. But the demolition derby, you know, there are a lot more cars crashing into one another, and instead of being shocking, it's just kind of like, like, oh, it's a real fun hoedown type thing. It's like, I thought when you crashed it was kind of like a big deal and yet these these cars that are having like their their bumpers smashed in and smashed back they're kind of like joking like ah, I got got the dings out. It's like well what what tone is this because it it feels way off in these scenes like it feels like the demolition derby should be more dangerous should be more more thrilling it's especially the way that they lock these cars in here and these there are all these kind of like Mad Max style cars like there's a there's an angry school bus who's got like piercings on its grill and it's got all these license plates lined up on its sides like oh I'm gonna get one more and it and it's kind of a cool aspect but at the same point it's like uh, this seems like it should be more dangerous than it should be, you know, kind of, you know, happy and fun here. Especially considering that the rest of the film is a little bit more darker. And I think that's that's the problem, is that this film, uh, this film takes itself way too seriously at points. Some might consider it a plus that Larry the Cable Guy's character of um, Mater isn't in this as much, and only because, like, in the second film, he was a, he played a huge role in that movie, and in the third film, he doesn't play much of a role at all. He's just sort of off to the side with the rest of the characters, just sort of watching the Queen from afar. But I actually kind of miss him, only because he's just, he provided a comic relief uh, to these stories, especially because this story, it becomes way too down in the dumps uh, about how, you know, how much it sucks to get old. I think the Pixar people who worked on the Cars film, just, they, they take this stuff way too seriously, I think, because they've made these three films, and uh, they've invested so much into these characters, and they probably love them a lot, uh, but the problem is, they never really won me over, so this movie is based on the assumption that, you know, that you've, you've seen these characters enough, where you like them enough, where you love them on the same level as, like, the Toy Story characters, that, you know, it's kind of bittersweet uh, to see them ride off into some different adventure that we might never see them again. But honestly, it it did nothing for me, especially because the whole idea, like, they, they didn't bother to explain why cars die or how cars are born. It's just, oh, it's just, it's, it's such a messy universe. 
So for Cars 3, I'm afraid I'm just going to have to give it two stars. It's not a, not a total loss, not a terrible, terrible film, but it's just kind of like, it just kind of goes out with a sigh for this trilogy. Our next film is a little bit difficult to describe. It's Colin Trevorrow's The Book of Henry, and this film, I swear, it's almost kind of like a challenge of trying to explain its brilliance to someone who's never seen a trailer or who's never heard of this movie. Um, so I'm going to do my best to try to explain why I love this movie so much. Naomi Watts plays the mother of two children, one of them named Henry, who happens to be a genius. And I mean a major genius. Like, when he brings in a book report, he makes it more deep than any of his other classmates. Uh, when, he's, when he's in between classes, he goes and he trades stocks uh, on, on the payphone outside. And when he gets home while his mom is playing video games, he's going over the finances for the household. Uh, it's pretty weird, a little bit crazy, but wait, it gets even crazier from here. So it turns out that Henry is kind of in love with the next door neighbor girl, uh, but he's worried about her because he, he basically spies through her window and can see that, uh, that her dad, played by Dean Norris, is beating her. And he's trying to figure out, well, what do I do? How, how can I stop this? And so he, he, he goes through all the different means of trying to figure out how he can stop this. Like, he tries calling uh, Child Protective Services, he tries calling the police, but Dean Norris is such, he's such a recognized individual in the community, and everyone likes him, that nobody wants to turn him in for, uh, for, for beating his daughter. And so Henry thinks, like, well, I have to do something about this, because, like, the one thing he can't stand is apathy. He doesn't want to see violence continue. He wants to, to, to get involved and to stop this, uh, which, you know, his, his mother is just kind of like, like, oh, honey, you shouldn't really do that. Henry eventually dies of a brain tumor, and he leaves his mother a red book with detailed instructions and diagrams and drawings of how to kill the next-door neighbor's father. Yeah. It gets pretty crazy from there. So essentially, Naomi Watts is trying to struggle with, you know, becoming a mom and trying to deal with the fact that she's taking a cue from Henry in trying to, uh, in trying to take out the next door neighbor who's beating his daughter. And because Naomi Watts, she, she loves the next door neighbor. She, she loves this girl so much. She wants to take her in. She wants this girl to be her own daughter. But she knows that Dean Norris is up to no good. And she's kind of trying to figure out a way to get around it. And of course, like Henry's detailed all these like notes, kind of like, like, oh, here's why it won't work if you go to Child Protective Services. Here's why it won't work if you go to the cops. What I love so much about this film is that it goes through a bunch of different styles and tones and it kind of shifts gears but but very naturally into different films. Like when the film begins it's sort of this kind of like a, a whimsical environment where you know where kids can be super smart and mom can you know play video games and she can be happy with her kids and they can have these great dialogue discussions. Like <laughs> Very, very fun discussions, like where, you know, mom starts swearing and the kids have to come like, Mom, Mom, you, sh you shouldn't swear. Um, and Naomi Watts, she, she really puts everything that she has into this role. Like, she commits herself to the role of this likable mom so much that you just, uh, my heart melted for her. I just, I loved her character so much. And, um, and but like I said, it, it shifts tones a lot. Like, it shifts between that and then becoming a little bit morbid with, you know, these detailed drawings of like, oh, how do we... How do we kill the next door neighbor? And it gets very rear window at times, you know, when he's spying over at the window to figure out what uh, what Dean Norris is up to. And then it even turns into like a, a action film towards the end, where Naomi Watts uh, goes is committed to going through with killing the next door neighbor by assembling a gun and getting a scope and then t timing out, you know, how long it's going to take for him to get out of the house and how long how much time she has as an alibi or a distraction that she can aim and and take him out. And it just it goes in. It takes such a weird, weird route, but I love it so much uh, just for how unexpected this movie is. Um, there is no way you will have any clue which direction that this film goes, um, especially for what's presented it. Now, I mean, I came into this movie cold. I had not seen the trailer. Um, I hadn't really read that much about it. Um, so I went into it very cold. And I think if, you know, I hope I haven't spoiled too much here, but um, if you go into this film, uh, I think you're going to be very surprised at the the various tones that it has. It has some really great writing in it, too. Uh, there's several points where the dialogue is very smart, and there's a lot of funny scenes in between scenes that, that could be, like, dark and somber. Um, like, at one point when Naomi Watts is grieving, she sends her other son to school with, you know, basically just packing her son's lunchbox with, like, sweets and cookies and brownies and cake and all this stuff. 
And the son gets to school and he opens it up and he's just like, he doesn't want to eat this crap. So he just looks around at everyone at the lunch table and is like, hey, anyone else want to, anyone want to trade some fruit for, uh, for my sweets here? And of course everyone goes for it, you know. Um, so yeah, there, there's some sweet moments to it. Uh, I like the focus on on the characters here. You really get to know and like Naomi Watts and her kids and, and even the, the students that are in the classroom. It's such a weird film, and I mean, it, the hardest thing about this film is trying to figure out who to recommend it to. And I guess I would say, I would recommend it to someone who feels, you know, feels that the movies are predictable, that there's nothing new out there, that, you know, that they know every single thing that's going to happen in a movie, and they're bored by movies. Basically, anyone who says that, you know, oh, I, I don't really care for movies, I hate movies now, show them the Book of Henry. They will be delightfully surprised at this film. So yeah, The Book of Henry, it's a very unconventional film. I'm not quite sure what type of genre I'd put it in. Maybe comedy, maybe drama, maybe maybe a little action film. Not, not quite sure where to put it there. All I know is that I had a blast watching this film. So The Book of Henry gets three and a half stars. Our next film is Band-Aid, a film which finds a couple trying to decide if they should go for divorce or if they should proceed into parenthood. They're not quite sure which route to go as their relationship is struggling. The couple is played by Zoe Lister-Jones and Adam Pally, and they are a couple who they fight over just about everything. Like the movie opens with them having a discussion about the dirty dishes, which eventually just leads into them screaming expletives at one another, just as loud, as loud as they can. But eventually, the more that they yell, they realize something. They realize that they harmonize well together. Now, well, at least we realize that we don't, they don't realize it quite yet, but they're getting there. They eventually take an interest in singing a song at a kid's birthday party of all things. They pick up a little plastic microphone and then they start a little duet going. And then they realize that the more that they sing together, the more that they can both air out their frustrations and begin to like each other more. So, you know, they basically, it's kind of, it's kind of like therapy for them. You know, they start singing a song and they start singing about all the stuff that, you know, that frustrates them or makes them happy or makes them angry or makes them sad or depressed. And they just, they get it all out in the open. And so by the time it's, you know, it's all in the lyrics, they're over it. They're, they're kind of, they're more concentrated on the song and how much they like the song at that point. Um, of course, you know, implied by the title, you know, that the music will not quite cure everything, you know, they eventually are going to have to talk about their relationship and try to figure out how to make it work, you know, they can't just rely on their their, their band to keep them together, um, especially because I think they realize that too, that's the important thing, is that there gets, there gets to be a point where they think, you know, that their music, they might have like a contract here, that someone might be listening, that might be willing to sign them, um, but I think they realize that, you know, th that they realize that that won't really solve their relationship as much, uh, mainly because, you know, success really hasn't been on the cards for them for quite some time. I mean, they look back on their lives where Zoe used to have, like, she used to have a book deal going, and now she's an Uber driver. Um, Adam was, you know, an, an adamant graphic designer, but now he just kind of, like, lounges on the couch all day and just kind of closes emails from clients that he's not willing to work with anymore. So they're just, they're kind of this couple that's, they're, they're disillusioned with, you know, trying to find success and trying to decide if they should keep the relationship going or form a family. You really do want to see this couple succeed, mainly because the moments where they, they are connecting, they, they do have genuine charisma. I mean, they have their in-jokes. I mean, they, they connect while smoking pot. They're, they're kind of, they kind of have their like weird mannerisms of like, you know, how they come on to each other, uh, you know, how much they love pizza, stuff like that. That they're, they're generally, amusing couple. Also amusing is um, that they hire a drummer played by Fred Armiston who's kind of kind of this quirky type of dude who likes uh, likes onesies and he likes to have cuddle parties and stuff like that. That's <laughs> pretty ridiculous character, and I, I had a few laughs out of him. So yeah, Band-Aid, it's, it's a very fun little light uh, couples comedy, like a little bit hipsterish, especially because, I mean, it's got Fred Armiston, so I mean, that's, it's got to have a little bit of a hipster vibe to it. Um, but yeah, it's actually, it's pretty sweet. The, the music's actually very nice. I like the charisma uh, between Zoe and Adam. They, they seem like a genuinely likable couple, even though they, they fight a lot of the time. And uh, it, it never really took off to like a huge point of drama or comedy, but uh, but it never disappointed me. I, I found it lovable throughout. Uh, so Band-Aid is going to get three stars. And now here's a recap of the movies I reviewed on today's program. Two stars for Pixar's Cars 3, a mostly sentimental end to Lightning McQueen's legacy. I just don't think it was much of a legacy to leave off on. Three and a half stars for The Book of Henry, which features some great acting from Naomi Watts and a very unconventional story with unexpected twists. 
And three stars for Band-Aid, a light and lovable comedy that finds a feuding couple trying to connect over music. Remember, you can read more of my reviews at moviespoon.com or movieswithmark.com, and if you like the show, well, give it a like and subscribe, and consider supporting it on Patreon for access to exclusive videos, as well as incentives of books and DVDs. My name is Mark McPherson, and thank you for watching.